Well, good morning and welcome to Knockbreda Parish Church. My name is Mark Hall and I'm on staff here at Knockbreda. I'm going to lead us through the service this morning. We're delighted that you've joined us, whoever you are and wherever you're tuning in from. As we come this morning to praise and worship God together, even though we may not be together in a building, we do so by first hearing God speak to us. So hear him speak to us from the Psalms. This is Psalm 78. And speaking about Jesus, the Psalm says this. He says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. This morning we come before a God who has spoken to us. So let's respond to the speaking God by speaking to him through song. So let's sing. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold
Well, although we come before our God this morning, our God who speaks, who has spoken in all of creation and who speaks through his word, the truth is that we come as a people who haven't always listened to him. We haven't always listened and followed what he has said in the way that we speak, in the way that we think and the way that we act. So using the words of this confession that will come up on the screen, let's confess our sins together beginning with Almighty God. Almighty God, our hearts and lives are open to you, and you know us better than we know ourselves. We confess to you now our sinfulness and unworthiness. Forgive us, please, for not loving you as we should, and for not loving our neighbour. Forgive us, please, for being self-centred, proud, and greedy. Cleanse us, Refresh us and show us the way we should go. Teach us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, if you're turning to Jesus Christ this morning for your salvation, know that in the midst of an unsure and uncertain world, that you can be sure and certain that you're forgiven of your sin because of the death and resurrection. Of Jesus Christ. Well, having come before him this morning and confessed our sin, let's seek his will by using the words of the Lord's Prayer. Beginning with our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Johnny for our children's talk. Have you ever heard a really catchy song and you just can't get it out of your head? It's just stuck in there over and over and over again, every day, all day long. And you just can't forget it at all. And maybe then you start to, to sing it out loud and, and everyone around you, they hear it as well. And so it gets stuck in their head and then they start singing it and it gets stuck in their head and everybody hears them as well. And it's just a huge big cycle of people singing a certain song in their heads. Have you ever done that? Maybe in your house or in your class at school? Well, it sometimes happens to me. I remember a few years back there was a film, it was called Frozen, and one of the songs in it was called Let It Go. And everyone, everyone was singing it. And it got stuck in my head, and I'm sure even if you've never watched the film, you'll know the tune. Well, I thought since that's such a catchy song, and everyone knows it, we could take a verse from the Bible and try and put it to that tune of Let It Go, and then we could learn it together, and it would help us to remember the memory verse, to remember the Bible verse. So it's been a few weeks now, but you remember that we were looking at some verses uh, from the book of Romans. And we learned that it was a letter that a man called Paul had sent the people in Rome. And it was to teach them all about God. And so the first we're going to learn is this. It's Romans from that letter, chapter 10 and verse 9. And it says this. If you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord... And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans chapter 10 verse 9. Now, here's the tune that we're going to listen to. Rebecca's recorded this for us. So Rebecca, do your thing. If you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, It's catchy, isn't it? So hopefully we'll be able to learn this verse together this morning. But I think it's not enough just for us to know the words and to have a nice tune to sing to it. I think we need to understand what these words mean as well. 
So let's think through this verse and learn what Paul was trying to say to the people in Rome, but also to us today, what he was trying to teach us about God. So the first part, the first little sentence says, if we say with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, what does that mean? Well, if we say that Jesus is Lord, it just means that Jesus is above all else in our lives. It means that he is number one. It means he's number one whenever we go to church. It means he's number one when we do our schoolwork. It means that in everything that we do, we want to put Jesus as number one. We think about what he wants us to do and how he he would want us to live. and, And we do it. We submit to his ways. We say that, Jesus, you're in control and we trust that your ways are the right ways for us to live. So if we say that Jesus is Lord, we say that we we trust him and we want him to lead us and we follow and obey him. So that's the first part. But the second part says, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Now we know that Jesus died on the cross. I say it quite a lot at the front, how Jesus died on the cross. But sometimes we forget that three days later, he was alive again. He rose from the dead. And the Bible tells us that people saw him and actually ate with him and and all sorts of different things that he did after he died on the cross and came back to life again. And that that sounds a bit crazy. If somebody told you that they were dead but were back to life again, you, you probably wouldn't believe them. But I believe that it really happened to Jesus because God is powerful enough to do it. And it shows us that, that Jesus took all of the punishment for us on the cross. There's nothing more that we can do to add to it. Jesus took the punishment that we deserve fully. And that's what this final little sentence means. It says just a few words. If we say with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What a great promise that we will be saved. We'll be made right with God and we're forgiven for all of our sin, for all of the times that we've um, disobeyed God. We're, we're made right with God and the, the verse doesn't say that we have to be good enough or that we have to do enough things to make up for our sin. We have to, to say with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, admit that he is in control of our lives and, and all of the things that we do and we believe with our hearts that he was raised from the dead, that, that he's taken the punishment totally for our sin. There's nothing more for us to do and if we trust in him that we will be saved. What a, what a great promise from God to us this morning. If we trust in Jesus and trust that he is taking the punishment that we deserve, we are forgiven by God. What a great promise to know. So let's sing our song again. I'm going to play it for us twice and so you can try and maybe learn it the first time round, but then the second time I want you to sing it. Sing along with Rebecca and maybe if you're feeling extra brave you could maybe record it or or send a little video and you could send that through to me so I know that you've been learning it. And maybe, why not this week, come back to this video on YouTube and you can you can sing along again and, and maybe learn it or hear it a third or fourth or maybe fifth or even sixth time. So let's sing along with our song. Let's see if we can remember this great Bible verse. If you say with your mind Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Romans 10 verse 9. That's how we remember the Bible verse. If you say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Romans 10 verse 9, that's how we remember the Bible verse. Well, in a world that's full of all kinds of opinions and beliefs, it's so important to remind ourselves what we believe as God's church. So using the famous words of the Apostles' Creed that'll come up on the screen, 
Uh, let's cite our common faith together, beginning with I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are the one true and living God. We come before you this morning as your church, your holy bride, a bride that you came for, that you left the majesties of heaven for that you lived in this sin-ridden world for, that you died upon a cross for, and that you rose again from the dead for. We come before you, Lord God, and we praise you and we thank you that despite rebelling against you, despite not listening to your words, despite rejecting your revelation, you still came for us. You still loved us. And you died and rose again for us. Lord God, we thank you so much for who you are and for what you have done for us. We cannot thank you enough. We cannot praise you enough. For you are a glorious and wonderful God. Lord God, we thank you for an upgraded church. We thank you that here we are your people because of your grace. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us to live as your people. Help us to be a people who listen to your word. I pray you'd give us a greater appetite and thirst and hunger for your word. Make us a people who, who can't read it enough, who can't think or talk about it enough, who want to read the Bible and learn the Bible more and more. Make us a people of the word. I pray, Lord God, that you'd help us to encourage each other with the word. Help us to embrace it and live it in all of our thoughts, our words, and our actions. Help us to be a people who go into our communities, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, and share the word of God. Help us to be a people of the word. Lord God, I pray for the team that is looking into evangelism at the minute in the church. I pray you'd give them wisdom and insight. Give them understanding of how best to help lead us forward and how to reach those around us. I pray you'd make us all an evangelistic people, a people who are always thinking about how to live out Christ and how to reach people around us with the good news of salvation. Help us to be an evangelistic people. Lord, I also realize that there's so many of us suffering in so many ways. I pray that you would draw near to each and every one of us. Comfort us. Draw close and draw near, Lord, I pray. I pray you'd give us great patience, great endurance, great confidence in the truth of the gospel. Where we might be doubting or where we are unsure of what we believe, give us greater confidence and conviction in all areas and aspects of our faith. Lord, I pray for this morning as we hear more closely from your word, through the preaching of your word, I pray you'd be with Stuart. I pray that you speak through him. Convict us, instruct us, challenge us, and lead us to love you more, to respond to you more faithfully, and to be evangelistic people of the word. Lord, we pray that you would take care of all of our needs. We pray that you would lead us and encourage us, that in all things, Jesus Christ would be proclaimed and loved and lived out for the glory of your name. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have the reading and then the preaching of the word. 
The reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. The parable of the lost sheep. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she tells her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, everyone, and it's nice to have the opportunity to look at God's word with you. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15, and we're going to be looking at the first 10 verses of that chapter. Uh, Think about a time whenever you have lost something that was valuable to you. Maybe it was a wallet that had all your cards in it, or uh, an expensive ring, or maybe if you're willing to admit it, it was a child. Now, try and remember what it felt like whenever the thing that was lost was found again. Um, I'm sure we could all tell stories uh, like that. Um, And I'm sure we can all also relate to that feeling of joy and relief whenever something that is lost is then found again. And our passage this morning, Luke chapter 15, is a passage that we can all relate to. It's not a passage about a lost wallet or a lost ring but ultimately about lost people. The two parables that Jesus tells are not here uh, to give us tips on how to find things. They're just telling us about the fact that God goes finding things. God goes searching for lost people and rejoices when he finds them. Now let me just say something before we get into this passage. What we have here in Luke chapter 15 is remarkably clear teaching, and yet it is not simplistic teaching. Um, Jesus uses the images of a shepherd who goes in search of a sheep and a woman who goes in search of a lost coin. And these are stories uh, that we have grown up with. They're stories that the youngest uh, in the children can understand right up to the oldest among us. But that does not mean that they are not profound in what they tell us. We have a bit of a habit, I think, in our culture of thinking that something that sounds really complicated is really profound, and something that sounds clear and simple is not profound. So, for example, um, I could hold this object in my hand, and I could call it a spade, and you wouldn't be very impressed at home. But what if I was to call it a unihandle, longitudinal horticultural implement? Well, then you might be a little bit more impressed. But here in Luke chapter 15, what we have is Jesus the cleverest man who ever lived, and yet he spoke with words that even children could follow. It's amazingly clear teaching, but we need to be careful that we don't relegate it to the Sunday school and just dismiss it as having nothing to say to us today. It's easy just to think, oh, that's just for the kids, but it's not relevant to my life. No, Jesus speaks in a way that is clear and simple, but it's not simplistic. Now, in order to get the impact uh, of the parables, the two parables here that Jesus um, tells us, uh, we need to get uh, his teaching and we need to set it in context. And we need to think about where we are in Luke's gospel. Um, Up to this point, Jesus has been having a series of conversations, uh, particularly with the the religious elite of his day. And it's all been around the, 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 the question, who will get into God's kingdom? In Luke uh, chapter 13, someone comes up to Jesus uh, and they say to him, um, will those who are saved be few? 
Will those who are saved be few? When it comes to the new creation, God's heaven, will there be many there or will there be few there? And Jesus answers shockingly. Uh, He says this, he says, strive to enter through the narrow door for many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. You see, when it comes to God's kingdom, says Jesus, it's not as easy to get in as many people assume. The door is narrow. It's exclusive. And that even uh, is a shocking message, I think, for our world, that not everyone is going to heaven. And in this section of Luke's gospel, he wants us to see that basically when it comes to this question of who is going to get into heaven, there are two groups of people. On the one hand, there are those who assume that they will. And on the other hand, there are those who assume that they won't. So those who assume that they will, namely, in our story, the Pharisees and the scribes, they are certain that they will get into heaven on the basis of their own religious pedigree and performance. But Jesus, in the last few chapters, has given them the shock of their lives. You won't be welcome, says Jesus, with your arrogant assumption that you're okay with God. So you've got those who assume they will, but you've also got those who assume they won't. Namely, the sinners and the tax collectors. These were the non-religious people, the social riffraff. They were seen as unpatriotic and they were seen as swindlers. So you've got these two groups of people when it comes to heaven, those who assume they're going to be there and perhaps have a surprise that actually they're not, and those who never imagined that they would be invited, and yet they are invited. And you'll see from the opening verses of chapter 15 that it's the unexpected people who are drawing near to Jesus, while the religious figures, what are they doing? Well, they're grumbling. Look at verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man, Jesus, receives sinners and eats with them. Now, I think we can kind of understand the grumble of the Pharisees. We can understand the idea that there are some things in life that are so exclusive that not everybody gets in. Uh, We see this everywhere. Think of popular TV programs like The Apprentice or The Great British Bake Off. Um, We almost enjoy, don't we, watching uh, the disaster candidate who doesn't have a clue getting dragged in uh, to the boardroom or before the judges and being axed. We understand the idea that only the best can get in. And we think to ourselves, uh, what on earth is he or she still doing here? We understand the idea of exclusive entry. It's only for the few and it's only for the best. And we can fall into the habit of thinking, okay, maybe heaven is a bit like that. Um, Not everyone can get in. I get that. I understand that. Only the best can be there. The door is narrow. Strive to enter, says Jesus. Okay, I've got it. But then what we see in these chapters, and in this chapter in particular, is that the very best, or at least those who thought they were, discover that it's actually the very worst who are friends with Jesus and on their way to heaven. And that doesn't go down well. They are raging because Jesus is welcoming people who are clearly morally inferior to them. Jesus has just said that it isn't easy to get into heaven. The door is narrow. He's just said that you've got to strive to enter. It's hard to get in. So why does he welcome those kind of people? They have no hope. How on earth could they make it into God's kingdom? How is that even possible? And so Jesus tells two parables to explain how it is possible that all sorts of people can make it into God's kingdom. Jesus tells us that they got in because God looked for them and God found them and brought them in. They got in not because they were looking for God, but because he was looking for them. And Jesus is about to tell us what has to happen for a person to get into heaven. And so the first big truth that we can see in this passage is this. It's very simple, that God seeks after sinners. God seeks after sinners. Look at verse 3 and 4. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country 
and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And then verse 8, or what woman having seven, or sorry, ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it. God goes seeking for sinners, and that is how all sorts of people make it in to heaven. That's how they get through the door, because God went looking for them. And I'm always struck by the imagery of um, these verses, aren't you? A sheep does not return to its owner, and neither does a coin. Sometimes I wish that coins would return to me when I lose them, but they show no sign of wanting to return. And all the emphasis in these two little pictures of the sheep and the coin, all the emphasis is on human inability. Let's just take that first image of a sheep, the lost sheep. Um, I don't know if you've played the game as a kid where you decide what animal you think most represents you as a person or that you would want to be. And the classic is usually a lion because lions are strong and fierce. Or some people go for a crafty fox who's able to get himself or herself out of uh, difficult situations. But almost nobody goes for a sheep because sheep are not very impressive animals. What do we tell kids to do when they can't sleep? We tell them to count sheep because it's the least scary thing you could do. And if you think about it, sheep in the wild are completely defenseless and vulnerable. They have no claws to defend themselves. They have no bark to warn off predators. A sheep that gets lost is basically a ready meal. And so when Jesus likens you and I to sheep, it's not supposed to be flattering. Another thing that I've learned about sheep is that when they are discovered, a lost sheep, when they're discovered by the owner, the sheep doesn't return to the owner. But actually what it does is it runs around in a panicked frenzy and then it just stops. So here's one guy called Kenneth Bailey who is um, a Bible scholar and he says this, A sheep, when it is lost, is terrified and will sit down while shaking and bleeding. When found, it is in such a state of nervous collapse that it cannot stand. It literally needs picked up and carried to restore it to the fold. And Jesus says, you and I, spiritually speaking, are sheep. Other religions, they'll treat you like a dog or a cat, you know, needing a bit of guidance, a bit of help, some training, that whenever we call it, it returns to us. But the gospel says, no, you're not a a dog or a cat that needs some training. You're a sheep that is helpless and needs saving. God seeks after sinners just just as the shepherd seeks the sheep and the woman looks for the coin. There's nothing that the sheep or the coin can do in order to be found. They are utterly dependent on the one who comes looking them. Now, that idea is not one that our society will accept. You see, the world likes to think of life not as the parable of the lost sheep, but as the parable of the lost shepherd. They would have us rewrite Jesus' parable here a bit like this. So imagine the sheep, and they're all talking to each other, as sheep do, and they're saying, Baha, have you seen the shepherd? Baha, you go that way over to the fence, Uh, I'll go this way over there and we'll see if we can find this silly shepherd who's got lost. And they find the shepherd and all the sheep are rejoicing. We find the lost shepherd. Now, it sounds a bit ridiculous, but that is how modern man thinks about spirituality. We are seeking God and God is hiding from us. But Jesus says it's the other way around. We are the ones who are hiding, and God is the one who is seeking. And this is the picture that we get as we read through all of Scripture. In Genesis, after Adam and Eve sin against God and mess up, what do they do? Do they return to God and seek him and tell him, look at what we've done, we've sinned? Nonsense. They hide from God because they're ashamed. But graciously, God seeks them and he covers their sin and their shame. And you and I, we are born with the same heart condition as Adam and Eve. We, by nature, hide from God because we don't want our sin to be exposed. Do you remember how Jesus described it? 
He said, light has come into the world, but men loved the darkness. And in these verses, there is no evidence of the so-called human quest for God. In fact, the opposite is true, stark and unavoidable. In fact, the entire story of the Bible could be summarized as God seeking rebels who hide from him. So let me ask you this morning, which version of reality do you accept? Lost sheep or lost shepherd? Is God hiding from us or are we hiding from God? My experience as a non-Christian was largely one of not wanting to be found. I would keep God at arm's length and the motivation for doing that was not that there wasn't enough evidence, but because I didn't want him to be in charge of my life. But God is the searching God. And he doesn't give up. He was persistent with me, and he is persistent with us. So in summary, the seeking shepherd and the searching woman, they represent God. The lost sheep and the lost coin, they are us. And apart from God, we are helpless and hopeless But God is the God who seeks sinners. He loves to find us and he parties at the find. Let me ask you, do you recall the reaction of the shepherd and the woman in the story whenever they find the sheep and the coin that they were seeking? Because that's going to be our second truth that we learn from this passage. Not that only God seeks sinners, but when God finds someone, there is great rejoicing. When God finds someone, there is great rejoicing. Look at verses five to seven. And when he, the shepherd, has found the sheep, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. And then down to verse nine. And when she, the woman, has found the coin, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Verse 10, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The conclusion of each successful search for the sheep and for the coin is joy and celebration. And who is it exactly that is at the center of this heavenly celebration? It is not the angels who are celebrating while God sits dispassionately to the side, observing and tolerating the festivities. The joy, do you see, uh, uh, verse uh, 7, the joy is before the angels. And verse 9, the joy is before the angels. They are the spectators, and God himself is the one who is celebrating. About a year ago, uh, my brother got married, and anyone who knows my brother will know that he is not a dancer. And in all the years that I've known him, he would never get up in front of other people and dance. But on his wedding day, my brother was up, and he was dancing like Bruno from Strictly. And the reason he was doing that is because he was so overcome by joy at being united to his now wife that he couldn't help but celebrate before everyone. And when God is reunited with one lost soul, he celebrates before the angels of heaven. Just let that sink in. The angels stop to watch God being uh, celebrating in joy. Isn't that stunning? God is ecstatic with joy at one person who repents and comes into a living relationship with him. Isn't that amazing? The God who has a universe to run galaxies to uphold, atomic particles to manage, and governments to rule in his providence, this God takes joy in one person who has their life turned round. We're told nothing about God's joy at election results or World Cup wins, but we are told of his joy when someone who was hiding from him is found and their life is turned around. What is Jesus doing here by giving us these images, these metaphors, of the celebrating shepherd and the joyful woman with her neighbors and her friends. Well, he is showing us the Father's heart. This is what God is like. 
God's all-consuming passion is to find the lost and bring them home. And do you notice, as we finish, that God is the opposite of the Pharisees? Do you see? Notice the contrast of the joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and the grumbling on earth of the self-righteous Pharisees. What a difference that is. It's really stark, isn't it? Joy in heaven, grumbling on earth. And the irony is that the Pharisees, these leaders, the scribes, they were meant to be the spiritual shepherds of Israel. All through the Old Testament, that's how they're described. But the reality is that they couldn't care less what happens to the lost sheep, especially if they're not the kind of people that they were used to associating with. But in contrast, here comes Jesus, the ultimate shepherd, the one who called himself the good shepherd, God himself come to earth and he couldn't care more. And we know how much he cares and how much he desires to seek the sheep in that he leaves the 99 like the shepherd and he risks everything for that lost sheep. Heaven is literally turned upside down in order to find the lost coin. And you and I, we know the extent to which Jesus went to find us. He came to earth and took on human flesh. He was the shepherd who was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He went to the cross and on the cross, Jesus was forsaken so that you and I could be found. He took on himself our lostness so that you and I may never be lost. So let me finish by speaking to two groups of people this morning. Firstly, to those who imagine that they wouldn't be welcome in God's heaven, for whatever reason it is, Jesus teaches us that a person is brought into God's kingdom when God seeks them and finds them and brings them home. And God has sought us in his son, the Lord Jesus. And his great desire for you is that you would return to him by trusting Jesus and that you would have your life turned around. You are helpless. There is nothing that you can do in order to save yourself. But Jesus has come looking. And his death on the cross in your place is sufficient to bring you home forever. But secondly, to those who assume, like the Pharisees and the scribes, that they are okay with God. You see, we've seen that not everyone accepted Jesus' version of reality. The Pharisees were just not willing to recognize themselves as lost and in need of rescue. Yes, other people, uh, they need lost or they need rescued, but, but not us. We're religious. They were self-righteously expecting to be in the kingdom of God. For them, God was their model. He was their example. He was even their boss, but he wasn't their savior. And in this passage, we see that it's the tax collectors and the sinners, the unexpected people who draw near to Jesus as God fulfills his plan to rescue and find the lost. And God is calling on his friends and neighbors to rejoice with him. The fact that the Pharisees and the scribes are grumbling at these sinners who repent, it shows that they are neither friends nor neighbors of God. They are against what God is for. And actually, they are the ones who are lost. And I think we need to be aware of this tendency of the Pharisees and the scribes in our own hearts. They had what we could call a religious performance identity. That just means that they believed if they obeyed and if they kept the rules that God would bless them. And they couldn't help but enjoy a feeling of superiority over other people who just didn't measure up. They had this religious performance identity. But when our lives are changed by Jesus, 
he gives us a new identity. And in the gospel, we are given a grace identity. Jesus says, my salvation is for weak people. It's only there for people who admit that you're no better than anyone else. That you just need mercy. You see, grace, when we realize that we too were lost and have been found, grace, amazing grace, it takes away any feeling of superiority. It's not that we searched for God and and we met him halfway. No, we were lost. But God found us in his grace and he brought us home. And then finally, as a church, what sound rings forth from us whenever a person has their life turned around by Jesus? If someone was to come in knock breeder and tell the church that someone had come to faith, that God had found them, that they'd understood Jesus' death and his resurrection and they'd been saved, would we be like the angels in heaven and God himself celebrating with joy? Or would we be like the Pharisees who grumble? Because it may mean that our church and our life looks different. Let me just finish with two stories that illustrate this. I remember um, a couple of years ago visiting a church in England and I sat down beside this, uh, this lady and the church had, had, had recently seen a lot of evangelistic success. Many people were coming to faith through this new uh, course that was being run. And I said to the lady, isn't it wonderful that so many people are coming to know Jesus through the ministry of this church? And she turned around to me and said, we don't want those kind of people in our church. And I remember leaving and just being stunned, thinking there is someone who does not know the heart of God. And if Jesus had been with her in that moment, what parable would he have told her? A couple of months after that, I was away on a Christian uh, camp. And I saw someone that I never expected to be there. He was a guy that I'd been to school with and wasn't particularly fond of and considered him not the most pleasant of people, particularly in how he had treated me in the past. But someone came over and I said, is, is he, why is he here? And they said, oh, he's a Christian. And in that moment, I felt the same grumbling spirit of the Pharisees who said, how could he get in? And uh, to my shame, we had lunch. I sat down with the guy. And as he talked to me, he told me about how he was lost and about how God in his grace had come looking for him. And that Jesus, through his death and resurrection, had paid for his sin, made him new, and had given him the hope of heaven. And I tell those two stories because sometimes we can think that the Pharisee attitude is out there. It's with other people. But the truth is that the Pharisee attitude can live even within us. So as we finish then, God is the God who seeks sinners and he rejoices when he finds them. So let's, as a church and as individuals, get on board with what God is doing in the world. He wants to use you and to use me in reaching lost people and bringing them home. And I love these words of the famous hymn, they say, I sought the Lord, and afterwards I knew he moved my, heart, my soul to seek him. It was not I that found the Savior true. No, I was found by you.
Well, thank you to everybody who has taken part this morning and thank you to you as well for joining us. We are back again this evening at half six on our YouTube channel where we will look at what it means to see and how we can come to see Jesus. We'll be looking at that from John's Gospel. Please do also keep checking out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. You'll see lots of things going on in both of those places. So do check those out as well. I find that last verse in Luke 15, 1 to 10, really striking. Where it says, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I remember speaking to a guy who became a Christian very, very recently. And thinking about this verse and thinking that when he became a Christian, when Jesus saved him and he gave his life to Jesus, heaven rejoiced. So this week, let's be a people who embrace these words and live out these words. That heaven may rejoice over our salvation and over the salvation of those around us. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday. We'll see you tonight.